Okay, hello everyone. To this uh, seminar in the series. So today we have uh, with us uh, Antonio Caña working here in the Instituto de Astrofísica de Valencia. We will be talking about the laboratory research, the absolute impact of the spacecraft to main field. Uh, so uh, Antonio made uh, his uh, degree at the University of Granada in his degree in chemistry. And uh, um, there he started a collaboration with the Department of Chemistry, uh, Chemical Physics uh, focused on the uh, Raman spectroscopy. Then he moved to the Universidad de Castilla La Mancha. He made a PhD on the chemistry of the interstellar medium, where he worked with a very special system to study the kinetics of chemical re reactions by using a supersonic uh, jet. Uh, he did his PhD, he made uh, several states, including one uh, three months at the University of Rennes in, in, in France. Then he moved to Paris uh, to work at the, as a postdoc in the Sorbonne University, uh, working with vacuum system to study the chemistry uh, of interstellar ices. Yeah, that's it. Okay, cool. <laughs> And then he went back to the Universidad de Castilla La, La Mancha for another uh, postdoc. Then he had a, let's say, a pause in his career uh, as a researcher. He was working as a teacher in high school in Seville for a couple of years. Maybe. One year, yeah. months. Okay. And since uh, okay. in the last, last year, he has been working here at the IAA uh, with a, a group in Juan Carlos and Olga working on this uh, topic of uh, the impact of the uh, the reentry of uh, the piece in the in the terrestrial atmosphere. So the floor is uh, to you. Okay. Thank you so much for your kind presentation. Thank you. And good afternoon to everyone. Today, as he said, I am going to talk about the laboratory research on the atmospheric impact of spacecraft reentry debris, perspectives and future challenges. So to guide you through this presentation, I have organized the information starting with a brief introduction and the, the issue that we're going to discuss today, space debris, then the potential atmospheric impact of the reentry of this debris, such as the thermal NOx generation, the alumina particle emission, and the effect of the anthropogenic metals in the upper stratosphere, lower mesosphere, followed by the research strategy to unveil the chemistry and the chemical fate of these metals, which is uh, based basically observation-oriented missions for reentry studies, Laboratory studies. There's a new lab here at the IAA, which is called uh, Sparks Lab, Studies of New Particle Formation Kinetics Laboratory, and the Atmospheric Modeling. And then to finish with the perspectives and our, our future work. As a curiosity, in this picture on the right side of the slide, you have a, the astronomy impact of the day from about one year ago. This is March 16th which uh, shows a computer-generated image showing the approximate location of a space debris. So, currently, the planet is already surrounded by human-made materials. So, as I am going to discuss the potential impact of human-made reentry materials, it is essential to distinguish between the two main sources of mass flux uh, within Earth's uh, atmosphere. On one hand, we have the natural sources, such as meteoroids or interstellar dust particles, for which there are several previous studies about composition, ablation, and chemistry. And on the other hand, we have the anthropogenic sources, which is mainly a spacecraft debris. In this case, there are only a few and very recent studies because the quantity of debris was negligible until the last few decades. Research on this topic is imperative because the, the space industry is growing extremely fast and the available studies concerning meteoroids cannot be extrapolated because the ablation of meteoroids and the ablation of a spacecraft debris is totally different. So if you look at this table here, you can see that the ablation altitude in the case of meteoroids is between 80 and 110 kilometers, and in the case of the spacecraft, we are between 70 and 40, where the chemical and the physical environment is totally different because we are in different layers of the atmosphere. The entry speed is also different. In the case of meteoroids, it goes from 11.5 to 20 kilometers per second. And in the case of a spacecraft, we, this is lower than eight. The entry angle also different from 45 to 10, lower than 10. The footprint in the case of meteoroids, 50 kilometers. In the case of a spacecraft, we go up to 300 kilometers. And the maximum temperature reached during the ablation is also different. 
So to provide more details about the difference between meteoroids and spacecraft debris, it is important to talk not only about the entry conditions, but also about the other thing that I said, the environment in which the ablation occurs. In the right side of the slide here, you can observe a scheme of the different layers of the atmosphere. The layers where the ablation of meteorites occurs, here on the top side in red, and spacecraft debris here in blue. It is important to distinguish between the amount of radiation that reaches the molecules in these layers. On one hand, in the mesosphere and lower thermosphere, we can find X-rays, extreme UV, and therefore ionic processes and ionic chemistry. In the stratosphere, we have no X-rays or extreme UV. Thus, the neutral-neutral chemistry will be the dominant process. The abundances of different molecules also change alongside the attitude. If you look at here, you can observe some molecules of water, methane, H2O, ozone, in the case of the space debris, and in the case of meteorites, we have ion clusters, we have HOX, and some other molecules that I am going to show you a few of them here. So as you can see in this table, the concentration of some molecules such as CO2, CO, and water, and also ozone and OH, increases when you go down here to 40 kilometers. It increases more in, for some cases, more than seven orders of magnitude. For some other chemical species, such, such as atomic oxygen, atomic hydrogen, or the ionic form of oxygen, which is involved in ionic processes, follows the opposite trend. When you go down to lower altitudes, here to 40 kilometers, the abundance is significantly lower. So these kind of processes, these ionic processes involving the ionic form of oxygen will be negligible here at these altitudes. I would uh, also like, like to point out the different in pressure here. At 110 kilometers, we're talking about uh, a pressure in the order of 10 to the power of minus four, and at lower altitudes, in the case of 40 kilometers, we are talking about 2.87. This pressure is extremely important in chemical reactions involving a third body. These kind of reactions will be negligible here at 110 kilometers. So I have already compared the differences between the ablation of meteorites and spacecraft debris. So now we can conclude that the chemical fate of spacecraft debris is different than the chemical fate of meteorites. Now, to provide a background of the size of the issue of the space debris in terms of uh, here it is. quantity, I, I'm showing you this YouTube video. Yeah. This is our sponsor to them. <laughs> Es el momento de disfrutar de un Kia Niro híbrido, híbrido enchufable o 100% eléctrico. Consulta condiciones en Kia.com. Kia, move on to Insalias. Currently, over 128 billion objects larger than a millimeter are orbiting the Earth, transforming the space around it into a junkyard. These objects range from inactive satellites to flakes of paint. But even a millimeter of cosmic junk traveling at extremely high speeds can be catastrophic to many satellites that connect us around the world. Indeed, a fleck of paint was enough to damage a window on the International Space Station in 2016. So where does all this space junk come from? Why is space junk dangerous? And most importantly, are we doing anything about it? We've been sending satellites to space for over 60 years. So far, we have sent over 11,140 satellites. And this was recorded two years ago, so now we have more than this. 72 satellites are currently active. The rest are inactively floating in our orbit. The number of satellites has increased drastically over the past few years. In 2020 alone, 1,283 satellites were launched into lower Earth orbit. This is the highest number of satellite launches in a year to date. Now, the low Earth orbit is about to become even more crowded. Over the next few decades, SpaceX is hoping to send a constellation of 42,000... They already sent some satellites, and you can even hire the internet services from them. They need 30 euros per month or something like this. ...thousands of satellites of their own, the Earth's orbit. All that space travel can lead to a disaster. 
The first documented collision involving space debris happened in 1996 when a French satellite was struck and damaged by debris from a French rocket that had exploded a decade before. In 2009, a U.S. commercial satellite, Iridium-33, collided with an inactive Russian communications satellite, Cosmos 2251, at a speed of 22,300 miles per hour. The collision created 2,300 pieces of space shrapnel, which now pose a threat to other spacecraft in low Earth orbit. This was the first known case of two satellites colliding catastrophically in space. Now, with tens of thousands of satellites traveling around 17,000 miles per hour, the chances of these satellites getting close to each other are a lot higher. Collisions between high-speed objects in orbit can create thousands of pieces of debris. This could result in a chain reaction where more and more objects collide and create new space junk in the process, to the point where Earth's orbit becomes unusable. The Kessler syndrome, coined by NASA scientist Donald Kessler, describes this phenomenon. How could we stop this orbital junk generating chain reaction? Directing parts of space junk down into the Earth's atmosphere where the frictional heat of re entry will burn them away could help. Into that. Yeah, I will stop here. So, it. Okay. So, as you have seen, the current strategy for these uh, pieces of debris is to promote or wait for controlled re-entry, but they don't, they don't say a thing about the potential atmospheric impact of this. But recent measurements have shown that about 10%, wait, with the laser, okay, no. About 10% of the aerosol particles in the stratosphere contain aluminum and other metals that originated from the burn up of satellites and rockets that need to re -entry. For this reason, the study of the re-entry of debris has emerged as a new research field and uh, the fate of the debris remains uncertain, with the potential to alter both the physical and chemical properties of particles and aerosols within the atmosphere. So we have seen that there are many satellites that someday will become inactive and are going to re-enter the atmosphere. So to understand and analyze the problem of the space debris, it is essential to know the chemi chemical composition of this debris. That's it, to pay attention to the chemical composition of the alloys used in the spacecraft industry. Here we can find elements such as aluminum, which is the predominant element. We have it in the structural components, in thermal control or propulsion systems. We also have iron in propulsion systems and some other minor elements such as, such as lithium in batteries or beryllium in communication instruments. So even if the topic is relatively new, the concerns for metallic space debris have recently captured the attention of international press. They have already written articles like this one here, where they say satellites are burning up in the upper atmosphere and we still don't know what impact this will have on the Earth's climate. So the international press and also the Spanish press has, uh, we have, we can find some articles where they say, científicos alertan sobre la contaminación atmosférica con cada lanzamiento espacial. And here they say, Muchas partes del satélite de cohete en desuso se queman en la atmósfera terrestre al reingresar, pero dejan una gran cantidad de vapor metálico en la estratosfera que puede ser nociva para la vida. So, to give more details about the atmospheric impact of reentry, it is important to distinguish between what we know and, we, and what we don't know. For example, we know about the loss of ozone by the NOx emissions, we know about the impact of the aluminum particles in the radiative forcing and also the ozone depletion, but concerning anthropogenic metals, we just know that metals are updated during the re-entry and have been found in the sulfate aerosol layer. So at this point, we need to evaluate its impact on the ozone layer, the sulfate layer, and the formation of polar stratospheric clouds. Concerning the thermal NOx generation, this is formed in the mesosphere due to the heat produced during rocket re-entry according to this uh, chemical reaction. This is just nitrogen plus oxygen and energy. So it means that we need a temperature higher than 1,800 Kelvin, produces NO and NO2. Using analytical approximation in 1980, so Park and Rashid calculated that the NOx produced during a space shuttle re-entry is about the 17.5% of the spacecraft mass with a peak emission at 68 kilometers that can be observed here. This is a Skylar rocket re-entry, and this is the NOx uh, emission between 100 and 60 kilometers. 
So we said that this is involved in the ozone depletion. So here we have the cycle of chemical reactions to reduce the, the ozone layer. So we have, this is just nitrogen oxide plus ozone produces NO2, then NO2 reacts with atomic oxygen, and then it's producing the NO back that it's going to keep reacting with ozone. So the next reaction is atomic oxygen plus ozone produces two molecules of oxygen. In the case of alumina particle emission, it is important to say that alumina particles are emitted during, combustion, during the combustion of some propellants. But today I am going to discuss the alumina particles that are emitted during re-entry. During re-entry, both particles and vaporized metals are released and the fraction of each, of each is still unknown. Concerning the alumina particle, they are formed by reaction between the aluminum Remember that this is the predominant element in the spacecraft industry and oxygen in the atmosphere. Then these alumina particles promote chlorine activation, so the formation of chlorine that is going to that is related to the ozone depletion via the following reactions. Chlorine under UV light produces atomic chlorine that reacts with ozone and for chlorine monoxide. Then this is this can also react with ozone to produce the atomic chlorine again and chlorine monoxide. At the same time, another molecule can react with atomic oxygen to form oxygen and chlorine. So our recent paper points out that the injection of five metric tons per year of alumina particles from the engine could double the, glo the global ozone reductions compared to the famous CFCs, the chlorofluorocarbons, in the late 90s. Regarding the anthropogenic metals, it's important to point out that the chemical processes of the elements vaporized by ablation of space debris should be <clears throat> analogous to that of meteoric ablation. The field of meteor ablation is well studied and can be used as a starting point to infer what will happen with the anthropogenic metals. The effect of meteoric uh, metal atoms is the formation of meteoric smoke particles. Here in the, on the right side of the slide, you have the schematic diagram of the relevant reaction pathways for iron produced by meteoric ablation. Here we're interested in the neutral neutral reactions. So, for example, we see he, we can see here the atomic iron is reacting with ozone to form iron oxide. Then this can keep uh, uh, can react with oxygen to form iron trioxide, and then this iron trioxide can form this mineral here, which is called hematite, or if it's mixed with the particles of silicon oxide, it is, is gonna be, this is gonna be forming pyroxene or pyalite. Iron oxide can also react with water to form this iron two hydroxide that is reduced with, uh, with atomic hydrogen to form iron hydroxide, monohydroxide. Then it reacts with ozone to form this kind of uh, iron peroxide which is forming this mineral, which is called goethite. These species are meteoric small precursor species. This picture you can observe the meteor ablation and the meteoric, and the meteoric vapors, the smoke particles that I have mentioned, and the ablation of space debris, such as the post-launch uh, rocket upper stage re-entry or satellites end of life destructive re-entry and consequently the formation of metal vapors and smoke particles. These anthropogenic metals likely gradually mix with the global background of metal and meteoric smoke particles that I have mentioned from meteoric origin <clears throat> as they circulate within the atmosphere. For this reason, the anthropogenic metals were detected to the, together with meteoric metals in sulfuric acid stratospheric particles. This detection was performed by the SABER mission, which consists on a NASA WB-57 high altitude research aircraft, something between 12 and 20 kilometers, using a particle analysis by laser spectrometer instrument. This mission provided the mass spectra of over 500,000 single aerosol particles. In the picture here, you can observe the mass spectra of the stratospheric particles. So you can observe here the results. And on one hand, in the upper part of the picture, we have the spectrum of particles containing a species of natural origin. So here we have iron, 
we have nickel, we have magnesium or, or carbon, which are in the stabilization of interstellar dust particles or, or, or meteorites. On the other hand, in the lower part of the picture, you can observe the presence of anthropogenic metals. In this mass spectrum, you can observe the presence of niobium, hafnium, molybdenum, lithium, and also you and you can observe also a rise in the peaks corresponding to aluminium or copper. So here I wrote a few of them, but over 20 elements from reality were detected and were present in ratios consistent with the alloys used in the spacecraft industry. So the anthropogenic origin of these metals is clear. So there are several possible consequences of the injection of this new material within the atmosphere. For example, aluminum and other novel elements might influence the formation of ice or nitric acid trihydrate, which is related with the development of polar stratospheric clouds. Another possible effect is that the metal cations have the ability to induce efflorescence with, uh, within aerosol particles. Efflorescence crystals can be larger and more irregular than the original salt particles. This change in size and composition can influence how they interact with light, critically impacting radiative forces. So to summarize the effect of anthropogenic metals, up to date, 10% of the stratospheric sulfuric acid particles, larger than 120 nanometer in diameter, contain aluminum and other metals from a spacecraft reentry. With a great uh, variety of metals present, so new physical and chemical properties, such as size uh, distribution, like scattering, relative forcing, or freezing point of the stratospheric particles are possible, and until the perturbation caused by such aerosols are better understood, they represent a growing uncertainty for the stratospheric aerosol layer. So what is the strategy? We have to use three tools here, or three branches of knowledge. We need observation-oriented mission for re-entry studies of the during and after the, the re-entry of the brief. Laboratory studies to predict, to predict the chemistry, explain the observations, and provide data such as, such as rate coefficient or the optical properties of the particles formed. And then employ this data by applying atmospheric transport and deposition models to evaluate the atmospheric uh, impact. These three branches are interconnected, and this is not like step one uh, observations, step two lab, step three uh, models. In, the results obtained in some laboratory studies can help to, the, to design oriented uh, observation-oriented missions, and at the same time, some results from atmospheric uh, models can motivate us or can help us to design new laboratory studies. So sending the observation missions, we have already pointed out the knowledge provided from the SABER mission in the previous slides. Apart from this, the most appropriate missions to study the space debris ablation have to be equipped with onboard uh, instruments, instrumentation to study spacecraft uh, re-entry, to analyze the physical and chemical properties of the particles and materials generated in the re-entry crew. They have to perform observations from aircraft to determine the chemical composition using emission spectroscopy and the use of uh, laser or sunlight scattered by the cube with a focus on the distinction of size and mass of particles might be implemented in the future. Concerning our laboratory studies, the goal is to predict the chemical fate of anthropogenic metals, considering the previous research on similar topics at different altitudes. To achieve this goal, we have a new lab here at the IAA. I already told you this is at building E, and you're invited to visit it uh, whenever you wish. So I have mentioned uh, the goal, and to achieve it, we need to first use our ablation simulator to detect, detect the species ablated and derived from the chemistry of Q metal samples, which are or alloys used in a spacecraft uh, engineering, and then to perform kinetic studies to determine the rate coefficients in order to include them into atmospheric models. Our ablation simulator is called uh, MASI, 
Meteor Ablation Simulator. And here you have the cross section of the experiment that consists on a tungsten filament that can be heated up to 2,870 Kelvin as the source of ablative metals from meteoric samples. The temperature of the filament is constantly controlled by the pyrometer that is here. And in this short video, you have an example of the ablation of iron three oxide uh, particles. As soon as we have our metal species in the gas phase, these metal species are detected by laser-induced fluorescence, LIF. To do this, we are going to use our lasers that can be observed here. In the top view of my system, we have two lasers in order to detect two species at the same time. And we have the two, also two photomultipliers located at 90 degrees. For example, this is the laser, this, let's say laser one, and this is its photomultiplier at 90 degrees in order to avoid undesired uh, reflections. The technique, the LIF, consists. First, a laser excites an electron or in an atom or, or molecule to a higher electronic level. And then we have the relaxation. The excited electron relaxes back to its ground state. This relaxation can occur through various pathways, including non radiative relaxation, the energy is just uh, dissipated as heat or through other non uh, light emitting processes. And then we have the radiative relaxation. The electron emits a photon with the energy equal to the difference between the initial and final energy levels. This is the fluorescence that our photomultipliers detect. Here you have a flow chart to summarize the steps of the Massey experiment. It starts with the load. So we have to load the temperature profile of reentry that we want to simulate. Here we have some examples of entry profiles used in the Massey software for interstellar dust particles at various velocities. In the case of space debris reentry, we have to prepare different new temperature profiles because the velocity in this, in the case of space debris, is uh, eight is lower than eight kilometers per second. And here we have a higher footprint, a footprint of three hundred kilometers that is traduced on that on time scales of more than one minute. Then the filament temperature is uh, as soon as we load the temperature profile, that the pyrometer reads the filament temperature. Then the program fire the laser pulse train. And then the LIF, the fluorescent signal, and the temperature data are sent to our control PC. And then we start again. In this picture here, you have the, an example for, of the laser induced fluorescence of uh, sodium. This is here, the black one here is iron. And this is the predicted and the actual temperature profile. The previous data were recorded at the University of Leeds, but now we are building, rebuilding, and modifying the experiment here in Granada. The modified version of MASI includes a time of flight mass spectrometer to detect polyatomic molecules. Using this experiment, we are going to have a great chemical approach with the goal of identifying ablative species and chemical sinks using realistic atmospheres in composition and pressure. We are going to use also realistic heating profiles. We're going to use real spacecraft uh, constituent uh, materials. We're going to use the alloys that are used uh, today, nowadays, in the spacecraft industry. And all of this by using the laser induced fluorescent, the LIF, to detect the ablation of selected atoms and diatomics, and the, uh, the mass spectrometer to detect polyatomic molecules, lacking an optical emission spectrum. Here you have a 3D view of the new mass experiment. And this is the mass spectrometer that has been coupled to the ablation chamber. This experiment is a unique, uh, unique experiment in Spain and is the only ablation chamber fully dedicated to the study of the ablation of space debris worldwide. This is how we started five months ago at building E. In an empty room with a mass spectrometer, the pumping system here, and here we have the lasers. There's also inside there. There's a toilet that might be useful to not use the focus while while doing your experiments. 
And then as soon as we received the optical, optical table, which is here, we were ready to set up the lasers. These are class four, the Olimi Jack lasers. And he, we also received the extraction hood. And we coupled the ablation chamber, which is here, this one, to the mass spectrometer. The photomultipliers are set. The windows to the lasers are also prepared. And the pyrometer, pyrometer is already working. Here you, got, you have a picture of our uh, tungsten filament. And this is at a temperature of 1,100 degrees Celsius. So the second step in our studies consists on the experimental determination of the of accurate uh, rate coefficients of the reactions between the elements released during the ablation with the molecules within the atmosphere. This is crucial to reduce the chemical fate of these elements. And here we don't we have to take into account the rate coefficient of our reactions, and also we have to take into account the abundance of atmospheric constituents. Because even if the rate coefficient is extremely high, but the abundance of, for example, atomic oxygen is very low, this pathway will be negligible. These are the reactions as we typically study in the lab. These are the reactions that we are going to study. And where X is a metal and M is the third body. And here we, we wrote an air because it's uh, basically air. So we are going to study reaction between the metal plus ozone to form the metal oxide metal oxide plus atomic oxygen to give us uh, the metal back plus oxygen. Some other reactions such, such as, um, I don't know, metal the metal oxide plus water to form the hydroxide, or this one, the metal hydroxide plus atomic hydrogen to form again the metal. So these uh, processes, reaction two and reaction four, are very important in the mesosphere. Because in the mesosphere, we have metallic uh, layers. And this is because even if the metal reacts with some, some species, this is recovered by some other processes. So in this table here, we have the available kinetic data. The first molecule that we are going to study today, not today, these days, is uh, lithium. Here you can, here you have a list of uh, of metals, and here you have uh, the atmospheric uh, constituents, the, the molecules that you find in the atmosphere. And for example, for lithium, the chemical reaction between lithium and oxygen has been previously studied. The uh, chemical reaction between lithium and water also studied. The chemical reaction between lithium and N2O, yes. Lithium and o, OH, yes. So we have some data, but we're missing a lot of them. So we need to know that the rate coefficient, not only of lithium with oxygen, we need to study the rate coefficient of lithium with ozone, the rate coefficient of lithium with CO, and the species derived, such as the lithium monoxide, with oxygen, CO2, CO, and all of them. So we are missing a lot of data here. In the case of aluminium, which is the second molecule that we are going to study, we have a lot of previous studies that will be extremely helpful. So the rate coefficient of the reaction of aluminum oxide with the uh, oxygen is available. Also the rate coefficient of aluminum carbonate with water or the, or the rate coefficient of, of uh, aluminum carbonate or aluminum dihydroxide here with atomic hydrogen. So these data are gonna be extremely useful. The third molecule that we are going to study, not molecule, the third metal that we are going to study is copper and here we find more or less the same thing that uh, we have found with lithium. So we are missing a lot of rate coefficients that we will have to determine. How are, gonna, are we gonna study the rate coefficient? So to determine the rate coefficients, we are going to use the PLP LIF, which is pulp laser photolysis, coupled to laser induced fluorescence. This is the scheme of the experiment that we, that we will build and it consists on a reaction chamber cell coupled to lasers to detect the gas species by LIF. We are going to use a dye laser to produce the fluorescence, and we are going to use a simmer laser to provide the atomic uh, metal in the, in the gas phase. 
This is connected with the photomultiplier, which is here, which is connected to the oscilloscope to visualize the fluorescent signal. The reactants are introduced by using mass flow controllers here, which uh, to control the carrier gas that will be mixed with water or our, or our another liquid, our reactant. Here I wrote a lithium iodide, which is a precursor of lithium in the gas phase. And there is also an ozonizer that allows us to prepare ozone from O2. Then the reaction mixture goes inside the reaction cell, where the temporal evolution of the LIF signal, produced in this case by lithium atoms, is studied. So by changing the amount of reactants, the temporal evolution changes, allowing us to determine the rate coefficient of, all of our reactant with ozone or oxygen or whatever molecule that we want to study. Here you have an example of the chemical cycle of, of aluminum. This is well studied. On the left side, we have the, the studies for the upper mesosphere, lower thermosphere. And on the right side, we have to have our prediction for the upper stratosphere, lower mesosphere. The first thing that we have to say is that cations can be neglected. Why? Because for velocities lower than eight kilometers per second, the ionization coefficient for aluminum is negligible. And the ionization and change, uh, transfer rates are very low. So all of these reactions discarded. Now we have to focus here in meteoric ablation. In our case, we have a spacecraft ablation. So we start uh, aluminum, uh, elemental aluminum is relief and it reacts directly with uh, O2. So we have this here, and we have this also here. Now we have aluminum oxide. Aluminum oxide. This is going to react with oxygen or CO2. Since the rate coefficients are available and we know the abundance of both of them, now we can predict that the aluminum oxide is going to follow this pathway. This is going to react with oxygen to form the aluminum trioxide. Here. Now it reacts with water to form the aluminum hydroxide, dihydroxide here, and then it can be reduced with atomic hydrogen to form the aluminum monohydroxide, which is here. But we have to take into account that we at uh, between 40 and 60 kilometers, we have a very low oxygen and hydrogen concentrations. So this process is going to be negligible and taking into account the higher pressure of oxygen and water, we predict the rapid formation of hydroxide. So this is going to react with water to form the aluminum hydroxide, which is, which is here. Then aluminum hydroxide, if it's uh, mixed with more molecules of aluminum hydroxide, it's going to form this mineral, which is called uh, gibbsite. And if it's, uh, if it's mixed with all the metal hydroxide, you will have a mixed uh, metal compound. Then these minerals, are going to be are going to reach the meteoric smoke particles containing sulfuric acid and hydrochloric acid. So taking into account that this is a base and this is these are acids, they are going to react to form salts such as aluminum sulfate or aluminum chloride, chloride plus water. Here we have the opposite. Here we have a fully known chemical cycle. This is the case of lithium. So there are no data for gas phase reaction of uh, lithium, lithium compounds. So we know nothing about the reactivity of lithium oxide. So here again, cations can be neglected in the first approximations. So now we start here, meteoric ablation, sodium, in our case, a spacecraft ablation, lithium. So sodium reacts with ozone to form sodium oxide. Here we will have the same. Also, the reaction with oxygen and the reaction, and then the reaction of lithium oxide with water. We don't know the rate coefficient of the reaction, but we can compare the rate coefficient of the reaction by using the data that we have for sodium. So, taking into account, taking this into account, the chemical pathway will be, looks like this. But now we have to take into account some other things. We have a low pressure of oxygen and hydrogen, so. This process is neglected. 
So now we just uh, don't know what's going on with this until we perform our, our experiments. In this graph here, it's very interesting because here you have the sodium oxide and lactate, and here you have the first order phase constant, and here you have the altitude. As you can see here, at high at uh, 90 kilometers, atomic oxygen is the one that dominates uh, chemistry. But when you go down to 60 kilometers, it's not uh, the atomic oxygen anymore. It's a molecular form of oxygen together with, with water and CO2, the chemical species that dominates the chemistry. About uh, the last part of the presentation about atmospheric models. So using laboratory measurements and observations, we can run atmospheric models to evaluate the atmospheric risks, such as the oxygen depletion. Here I have an example of a widely used model, which is uh, GEOS uh, CAM, which using several data as an input. And look, notice that the space scrap debris is not here yet. Give us an output of 3D concentration of, of atmospheric components. Another example is the whole atmosphere, atmosphere community climate model, WACAM, that which is a comprehensive numerical model spanning the range of altitude from the surface to the thermosphere that allows us to predict or to model the, the atmosphere to, to solar cycle and the flux of energetic particles. For another example, the impact of volcanic eruptions or tropospheric climate, to pronostic the stratospheric aerosols or the temperature trends in the stratosphere or the chemistry. In the case of uh, meteoric metals, there are models available for sodium, magnesium, potassium, and also iron. And the model predict this model predicts very well the height at which the metal layers that I have mentioned by reaction with the atomic oxygen or atomic hydrogen are formed. They also predict the relative importance of different species, the seasonal and daily variability, and also produces the LIDAR observation as well as the rocket probes for atmospheric studies. This model has been used together with the community aerosol and radiation model for atmosphere, which is uh, Karma. Karma is uh, integrated inside Wacom. And it, this was used uh, to pre predict, to simulate the March monthly average uh, or the average concentration of a hypothetical reentry aerosol from a using this model. So the model the prediction is here. So reentry aerosol leaves the, the emission region, which are here, the repoxes, and, begin, and begins to accumulate at polar latitudes within a matter of uh, months. The square here, it represents the region where the Saber mission took uh, these uh, measurements. So concerning perspectives and future work, the injection rates of certain metals like aluminum, lithium, manganese, and copper, which are commonly used in satellite manufacturing, are already surpassing those of, of natural cosmic dust, as found by Murphy in 2023. And with the rapid deployment of the large satellite constellations, the anthropogenic injection will increase dramatically compared to natural sources. Particularly concerning is the injection of metals, which could exceed the 30% of total material deposited in the upper atmosphere annually. Future work to finish uh, the setting up of the modified uh, massive to detect the molecules formed during an atmosphere ablation use the, uh, the MATI data to modify and adjust the predicted uh, chemical scheme that I have shown you. Uh, build the kinetic experiments to measure the coefficient of reactions considered in our chemical schemes. Modify the chemical schemes taking into account this uh, kinetic data. Incorporate this chemistry into a global chemistry and climate model together with the injection rate from the ablation of cosmic dust and the anthropogenic injection. And finally, evaluate the potential atmospheric implications. So to conclude, I would like to express my gratitude to my research group and to you for your attention.
Okay, thank you, Anthony. So, questions? Well, I will start. Okay. Uh, regarding your new lab, yes, uh, so that. we have discussed the, the, the utility for, for this particular project, the impact of a spacecraft. Uh, okay. But I guess it can be used to measure any gas by gas phase chemistry reaction rates. Isn't it? This is not for reaction rates. No, no. This is to detect the species that are formed during and after ablation. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you have a sample. You can deposit uh, your sample here in the tungsten filament. And if it's a solid, you will have a gas. And then you can use the lasers and the uh, time of flight mass spectrometer to detect uh, the, the metal to uh, is it? Sorry? You need first this ablation. Uh, I mean, you cannot measure any. Imagine CO2 plus OH reaction rate, for example. Can you use the OLA for those kinds of uh, reactions or only for this metal? Uh, well, if you put inside CO2 and, yeah, and OH, so you, you, will, you will detect the fluorescence of OH and you will detect the species that are formed inside using the time of flight mass spectrometer. And, and what's the, the temperature and pressure range with which you can work? Because if you want to measure a species in the or chemical reactions in the mesosphere, stratosphere, you need to. Yeah, well, the, the ablation temperature is, uh, the maximum temperature is 2,870 Kelvin. But yeah, the, there inside, we are going to reproduce the conditions of the of the stratosphere. So we are going to use the same pressure, same chemical composition. We're going to try to reproduce everything. Yeah. Yeah, um, well, it's, uh, I'm really very glad that we have such a very nice facility here at the Institute. This seems to be really promising and um, can be used by many things that uh, have been mentioned by Francisco. Um, I have a couple of questions. I think you are really most interested now in focusing on aluminium and lithium. Yeah, lithium. One of the very first figures you showed it was the concentration of the different uh, metals on the spacecraft debris. So I can remember that was a very big, like 40% was aluminum, is it correct? Ah, oh, let's so, hold that. At the very beginning, you show the percentage of the metals. Oh, yeah, here it is. Uh, oh, wait. Here, that one. 40%. So about yeah. 40 percent is aluminum, this thing. Yeah. And then 24% is for what? Others, just uh, some other metals that are. And the lithium, where is that in that in that diagram? Which is the percentage of lithium? The percentage of lithium is very low. Right. And so I have two questions. One, aluminium, it's very common, but you said many reactions have been already measured or are known. And on the other hand, lithium is a uh, very case, good at concent concentration. So. Why well, are you you plan to remeasure the other collision or weight uh, other sorry <laughs> so to yeah. measure again the rate coefficients of aluminium yeah, with the other three constituents three. No, we already have the data and if we find or if we observe something strange we will remeasure the coefficient but the measurements uh, should be okay um, right and about the lithium Lithium, aluminium was studied because it's present in meteoroids and interstellar dust particles, but lithium is not. For this so reason, there are no studies. This, uh, such a small concentration, why are you, interested, are you interested in it? Because a layer of lithium has been detected in the mesosphere, and lithium abates at a very low temperature. So for some reason, there's lithium up there, and we want to know what is going on with this lithium if it, if it falls down to the stratosphere? Yeah, but there is also a, a very interesting fact about lithium, which is why we want to study, and it's because it seems to be very sensitive to anthropogenic activity. So apparently, the nuclear uh, tests that were done in the 50s uh, in, the, in the mesosphere sort of injected a massive amount of lithium in the mesosphere, in the mesospheric layers, and then uh, they were immediately detected. So uh, one of the things that we believe is that uh, lithium can be like a marker for human activity uh, because uh, ablation will release a lot of lithium into the atmosphere. So we can, by probing by laser, the lithium layer, we'll be able to sort of uh, um, uh, follow what is the evolution of the injection of anthropogenic material. 
So that's one of them, but that's basically the main case. Why did you say this? Oh, so you're, you're using it like the, okay, and the case is study for the yeah. level of price to the other, which are yeah. more than So there's, there are very, as Antonio said, there's very little data about lithium in the yeah. reactions with lithium with anything. So we are able to put that into Wacom and Wacom give us a good prediction of the natural lithium layer. Then we can start doing an injection of uh, anthropogenic material to see how it evolves and compare it with the, for, uh, with, uh, the uh, observations which are planned in the future with uh, LIDAR. So there are a few groups which are already sort of trying to measure uh, lithium again. Is that being measured by a large amount of lithium already in the Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the, natural, the natural layer is in the bar. Yeah, the natural layer is very small. But uh, suddenly there was an explosion of lithium in the mesosphere, so the layer, the layer increased by a lot. Yeah. And that was because of this uh, nuclear tests. Okay. Um, about the, the instrument, about the lead, yeah. uh, which is the spectral characteristic? It, it, can it be tunable? Can you change from one spectral region to the other and to for that for measuring different metals, I guess? I mean, the spectrum of the different matter are going to be different spectrum of the region. So is it, uh, that's a technical question, is it tunable? So you can choose the, or just only a fixed uh, spectral range? Well, for some, depending on the on the atom or molecule, you have more than one transition. So yeah, you can tune it. You can choose one of the, the transition in which you are interested. And then you can, since we, our laser is tunable, so we can adjust the wavelength or ex of excitation, and then we can detect the fluorescent signal. The so you are instrument, you can really look at different, because that's, I think it requires quite yeah, a yeah. nice so, spectral resolution. So you can choose. We are using this uh, day laser, and for example, the wavelength range is from here, I wrote from 340 to okay. 600 nanometers. Right, okay. So changing the dye, so you will obtain different so, wavelengths. Okay, I've seen that this technique has been used a lot for measuring many collision and deactivation in different levels. So I, yeah. this is not solely what you mentioned about chemical reaction, but also about the processes about the energy exchange could be used. Because, well, I didn't know that. Well, really, well, I mean, for me, it has been to be like a very good technique. And they didn't know that we have really been able to use this facility here. So you see that also, uh, 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 what's the name? Is it come from from the laboratory of John? Yeah, all this all this equipment uh, came from the leads from the from the laboratory of planetary atmospheres. Yeah, and yes, uh, uh, Antonio is an expert on OHA measurement, so he he's been measuring OHA with dilators for for a few years. Okay. Right, and I just have a, a little bit mixture. You okay. mentioned about the experiment of Massey, but then at the is it also the same experiment you of the same instrument or spark or massive massive what's the difference between massive and the spark spark is the name of the lab and mass ah, is the name of the right yeah. and so uh, is it the the one that you use for measuring the the chemical kinetics is the, the same instrument no to, to measure the, the chemical kinetics we will build a new instrument okay. which is basically a flow tube fast flow tube which uh, will allow us to detect the, um, to measure the rate of physics. Yeah, okay. So there are two, two different instruments. Yeah. Okay. This is why we need an extra room. For yeah. <laughs> for the other, for the chemical, uh, for the kinetics, right. All right. Let's go here. Okay. Uh, well, I think that's all I wanted to make. Well, they will have a, another Question about you said about at the very beginning also that the ten percent of the aerosol we have to measure in the stratosphere they contain aluminium. My question is when you say contain uh, how yeah. much contain is it? Well, mm, this is not about how much, but, but uh, measurements have shown that the ten percent of aerosol uh, particles. Yeah, but contain aluminium. How much aluminium do they contain? Uh, oh, what do you mean? Yeah, you, know, you, you have these kind of particles naturally contain aluminium. Yes, but how much aluminium? If the rise of if the peak uh, uh, corresponding to aluminium is higher, it means that there's a natural an anthropogenic injection inside. 
Yeah. But yeah, how much it's uh, very it's very difficult to say. So if you really look at the mass spectrum here, so this is the peak corresponding to aluminium. Yeah. Here, yeah. if you look, if you go up, this this one, right? Yeah. I mean, it's very yeah. Yeah. These are in terms of uh, <coughs> concentration, these are quite uh, qualitative. So yeah. you cannot tell uh, the, uh, the absolute abundance. But okay. it is known that, for example, a meteoric iron in uh, in uh, sulfuric acid particles is about 05 percent. So aluminium must be lower than that. Right. But, but I, I think this is not the point. The question here is that these metals uh, independently of the yeah, yeah, so they, they, they have they have reached a composition where they can change the the the, pro, the, the proper properties of iron. Yeah, it's so a, they act as nucleation. Uh, exactly. Uh, iron also intervenes in uh, redox chemistry within aerosol. So just a minimum amount of it. It doesn't have to be the whole uh, thing uh, iron. So if you have a small amount of iron, you can start to have an influence on. How relevant chemistry goes inside. Okay. So the the relevant question here is uh, what is the impact on the lunar layer at the end? Yeah, exactly. And this will be likely an important. Yeah. Yeah. So the other the other aspect is if you have more condensation nuclei, you will have more so Therefore, you may also have an influence on radiative properties properties of the lunar layer. Yeah. I live on to study those changes, not directly chemical changes, but those changes in the aerosol to give them over. In the, in the, so we are planning to do this in the long term because I mean, we have a collaboration with John Blaine, who is now on, and people who is working in his lab, who is doing just basically heterogeneous and liquid phase chemistry. So what we are going to provide is uh, material for uh, uh, that could be serving as uh, nucleation, uh, condensation nuclei, and also that changing properties so that they can study how the, the composition of the condensation nuclei can change the properties of uh, uh, ice formation or growth of particles and so on. So this is on the other And then when, when we have done this uh, work with John in the lab, then we will be able to put again that in the mode. So it's, a, it's a, like a middle, middle term project. Right. But it, it seems to me that probably as important as the chemical process as also the physical process. I mean, how much particle, which are the size of the particle that you have because of condensation, I guess. I mean, you have a piece of metal aluminum like that, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. care. but then how many small pieces of aluminum you have? That is, so how can we evaluate that I mean, from the a given re-entry or, or could you be also in your lab if you have a metal and you Got it in a small pieces to know which it could be the side distribution or, or oh, are there any modeling on that? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I should actually your well, to detect or to analyze this kind of uh, this effect, we need for observation oriented missions for re entry studies. But we also have another lab here in our research, research group, yeah. Colula, which is going to study the optical properties of some aerosols. Okay. But yeah, it's very difficult to know. To know that's the point, the uncertainty, yeah. because we don't really know what's going on with it. Yeah, well, I'm not worried, worried, worried about this. The optical property of the particles containing aluminium rather than the yeah, so. to understand the scattering of these kind of particles, and then we can mm -hmm. try to conclude so some area of anthropogenic effect that really yeah. is yeah. very, very important. So, at the moment, we, we know or we there is a an idea of how the launching of uh, new constellations may go on right. and how much material you can have over there. With the new policy of uh, zero degree of ESA, you're going to have injecting all the material in a period of a few years, five years, mm -hmm. I think it's a yeah. So that material will fall into the atmosphere. It will, the material will completely uh, 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 disintegrate. A fraction will disintegrate in the form of particles and another fraction in the form of, uh, of uh, yeah. vapor. We don't know what is the fraction of vapor and what is the fraction of aerosol. So yeah. in that sense, uh, we could do in code lab something about uh, how to uh, detect the aerosol fraction and what and characterize it. And still, we don't know what is the amount of vapor that is formed. We don't know the chemistry of that vapor. We don't know how it mixes with uh, MSPs. We don't know how it gets into the stratosphere. Mm -hmm. We don't know how many condensation, new condensation nuclei are available. We don't know what is the chemistry trigger into the aerosol. And so on. So, and another, it's another, another variable which is also all this will end up depositing the snowball. And you have uh, uh, copper, you have uh, zinc, you have 
metals which are essentially uh, poisonous, so they can accumulate further mm -hmm. into the ecosystem, the polar ecosystem, doing harm to to uh, animals and collapse. Yep. Very interesting. Are there other questions? I had a, a question related to the uh, measurements of uh, kinetic rates. So yeah. you mentioned that a lot of, of uh, reactions uh, have already been exploited in yep. terms of aluminium. Uh, I wonder also about, for magnesium or silicon. Yeah, I wonder about the accuracy of, of, of the determined rate coefficient about the uh, uncertainties. Uh, and uh, in particular in the context of, of uh, your measurements, your planning, uh, are, is the technique you are going to uh, apply uh, essentially the same as has been applied to measure these rate constants, which are obviously uh, very relevant due to the large amount of aluminum, or is it a different technique which might uh, allow to reduce errors uh, and constrain these reactions better, which would be then a motivation to redo uh, uh, measurements which have already been done. Well, most of them were uh, determined by using the same technique. Same technique. Since laser and so it's, it's not expected. And this technique is uh, it's very precise and it's uh, very, it's, well, it's used to calculate the, to determine the rate coefficient. It has been used uh, since uh, 1980 or 1990s. And the the rates are are, are great. Are okay. So what, what are the typical error ranges? Five percent, ten percent. That depends on the experiment. So for example, if you measure aluminium, metallic aluminium, the uncertainty should be lower than in the case of I don't know measuring the rate coefficient of aluminium oxide or aluminium carbon. Because to uh, when you can control the concentration of aluminium, it's uh, it's very easy to control it. But when you produce aluminum oxide or or you produce in, in situ aluminum monocarbonate, so you can have some uncertainties. But this is these species are measured by the the amount the concentration is measured uh, using uh, an app, it's here an absorption cell. So what we have uncertainties, especially with this kind of uh, species, but are acceptable. Do you have concern about OH rate constants? Um, well, my, my personal experience when working with chemistry is that uh, uh, laboratory measurements uh, for, for same rate constants provide uh, error, error margins, which are not, uh, which, uh, well, no matching the... they're not, not matching exactly. So uh, I, I think yes, it's 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 always important to to improve uh, uh, kinetic uh, kinetic rates in terms of laboratory measurements. Yeah. And that that was basically the reason why. I mean, are, apart from what you mentioned, there are a lot, I mean, for example, in the case of OH, is a major source of uncertainty is that it's so reactive that you, it is very difficult to have to isolate a single yes. reaction, right? So you want to measure OH plus something. But then you're gonna have surely another um, a, a product of that reaction reacting with OH itself. So it's very difficult to disentangle the effect of two reactions happening at the same time. Yeah. So then you have to feed that into a model. So you have to start playing with unknown parameters, feeding three or four parameters with a reduced amount of data. So that increases it's, it's significantly the, the uncertainty. What else? What, what he was saying, aluminium plus oxygen is very easy. Aluminium is, is uh, it just ablated from a from a target or photolysis molecule, you get your aluminum atom nicely, and then you have an oxygen concentration, which is very easy to determine. So, red constant is going to have a, the, an error of less than 5%, probably. So, so, the general problem is you can constrain the known error, but you never can constrain the unknown error. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. More questions? More line? More questions? Okay. Let's thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.